I've been kind of dreading this one. Let's jump right in instead of waxing poetic about design. Mmm, it feels so good in the hand. As if the last phone I reviewed was made out of razor blades and rusty rebar. I want to start immediately with my biggest issue. The iPhone XS represents a poor value for what is otherwise a good smartphone. While Apple marketing claims this is an amazing, revolutionary device, we can all acknowledge this is a well-built, all-rounder phone. Apple can't have it both ways. They never lead or push the boundaries. Their supposed advantage is waiting out new raw technologies and refining them for mass adoption. By that metric, not Apple's marketing claims, everything on this phone is good to very good. But the XS never completely surpasses competing devices in any significant way and it'll lose handily in individual feature comparisons when weighed against specialist phones. I feel a lot of comparisons to Android devices are based on an out-of-date idea of what Android used to feel like, not what this market really looks like today. Google and Apple have been in an operating systems arms race. iOS has been tacking on more functionality at the same time Android has been getting prettier and more fluid, and these two companies continue to meet in the middle. And there's my struggle. I have a really hard time with a phone that just generally does everything well, redefining the upper limit of smartphone pricing. We've long chided this company over the Apple tax, but this generation of phones looks to be turning up the heat more significantly on those lobster pot price increases. If you're an Apple fan and you've even made it this far, you're likely already bristling. Then just don't buy one. People should just use what they like. I'm over the haters. I get it, we become fans of individual manufacturers, but commentary and critique are important for two reasons. Reason the first, Though I don't often use Apple as my daily driver, I still have a number of friends and family who do and continue to turn to me as a resource for purchasing decisions. And reason the second, when Apple leads the way on bad ideas, it often drags the rest of the market with it. The XS doesn't directly affect me this year, but we can be reasonably certain that we'll see some influence in 2019 and 2020 over the phone brands I do enjoy using personally. So I've just dropped a big, stinky claim, and now it's time for me to defend my assertions. I have a thesis, so here's my supporting evidence. The pros and cons as I see them. Starting off with design, it feels really nice in the hand. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm joking, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. I love that Apple used stainless steel for the sides of this phone, something I miss tremendously from the LG V10, which was a tank. And we've seen that the iPhone is surprisingly resilient against corner and side drops. I went with the silver variant, which is a phenomenal color for hiding fingerprint smudges and scratches. But let's not kid ourselves. This phone has almost never been out of my office naked. I am no Neil deGrasse Tyson phone flipping ninja, and even he uses a skin to change the conditions of his claim. Cheating, Neil, cheating. But maybe my biggest gripe with this aesthetic though, I'd really like to see Apple deliver a flush camera module again. The unbroken back on the iPhone SE still represents my all time favorite look for an iPhone. And it's just another point where the XS, I feel the use of a case is mandatory. If we're going for sleek, this breaks up the rear casing. It bugs me on other phones, but it is especially asymmetrical on the iPhone. And it's not like iPhones are so much dramatically skinnier than the competition. This is a tenth of a millimeter thicker than the LG V40, which, you know, headphone jack. I'm something of an anomaly for phone reviewers this year. My personal iOS device was the iPhone SE, and my last professional iPhone review was the 8 Plus, not the 10. So this is my first long-term test drive of a phone without a home button, and I don't much care for it. I'm not particularly impressed by arguments like, you get used to it. I think technology should adapt to me, not the other way around. Apple has to change a lot of things to deliver a mostly screen front face. iOS isn't super flexible to begin with, so many of these adaptations are clumsy. The home button was super useful, and arguably too much functionality was grafted onto it. But it's not a great look when after a year, videos like how to turn off your iPhone 
are still generating traffic. If you really want to delve into the philosophy of why I'm annoyed, I'd recommend checking out episode 266, 266 of the Pocket Now Weekly, around the 45 minute mark, where we interviewed Jody Holtzman from AARP. Change for the sake of change is something we savagely criticize Android manufacturers for. Jody shares some great insights on technology and how when you design with accessibility in mind, it has positive effects for everyone. Every interaction on this phone is clumsier. Every interaction requires a bit more attention, a bit more consideration. You have to manage the phone a little bit more. And Face ID is a perfect example of this and probably the topic I've gotten the most ire over. Yes, people have adapted their behavior to face scanning but it is demonstrably more complicated to use and is easier to interrupt than Touch ID. From sunglasses to odd viewing angles to the simple act of just taking the phone out of my pocket, Touch ID is better, faster, and more consistent. I regularly encounter the argument, well, how else are you going to see your notifications? As if it's my job to fix Apple's dumb design decisions. But there's an important data point I need to share about my own personal behavior. I am actively working as hard as I can to minimize distractions from my phones. It's a quest I've been on since my first monochrome screen experiment almost three years ago, later interviewing a clinical psychiatrist about smartphones and addiction. When I pick up my phone, I want that to be an active use situation, an interaction with purpose. When I want to scan my notifications, I have a perfectly good notification shade. When I want to get into the phone, Face ID regularly stands as a barrier to the most streamlined interaction I can achieve. Touch ID gave me a great choice, see notifications or push past them. I get no such choice on the 10s. Though notches look dumb, I still hate them. The display quality is very high. In daily use, this is a wonderfully color accurate screen and one of the brightest OLEDs you can find. I really like that the maximum user controllable brightness is about the same as the auto mode. I can push a few Androids brighter, but only in short bursts, in auto, in direct sun. And the only other phone I've used that allows the user to manually crank that screen brighter has an LCD. My only nitpick, and it is a small non-deal breaker for most people, is the resolution. Apple continues to use odd non-standard resolutions derived from their retina metric, but this pixel density is closer to a OnePlus than it is a Galaxy or an LG. Sure, you can't discern individual pixels at a foot from your face if you have 2020 vision, though that doesn't fully take into consideration the human eye's ability to discern more information like converging lines at a much higher pixel per degree density. And you're probably not that concerned about aliasing, video artifacts, moiré, other elements that the eye might be able to discern when discussing higher resolutions. We can all agree that while there are benefits to higher resolutions, we're likely dealing with diminishing returns. But the iPhone doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are phones that greatly surpass the 10s pixel density at lower prices. Just because you don't need it does not mean you aren't paying more for less. You might want it. And performance is exactly another area where it's difficult to discern bang for buck. The A12 Bionic is an absolute beast of a chipset, and we have all the synthetic benchmarks to point to. But actually monitoring real-world improvements has proven a bit more difficult. I posted this video about benchmarking, and I'm disappointed but not surprised that many people commenting seems to intentionally miss the point. That whole video describes what it takes to create one consistent test to judge one aspect of performance. One test is obviously not indicative of overall phone performance, so the title of the video is literally what I'm trying to accomplish. How else should we grade improvements from year to year? Oh yeah, right. Like people really edit and render videos from their phones. <laughs> well, I didn't make that claim. Apple did. They have a whole page on this in the App Store. And judged against Apple's claim, my first generation iPhone SE performs better than my 10s. So we need more and better tests to consider real world performance. Another real world example, the iPhone XS runs noticeably warmer playing MP3s than my LG G7 does listening to FLAC files. We know there's no special thermal dissipating hardware inside iPhones, 
So is this additional heat just cooking the internals? Why is this beastly processor running warmer listening to music? It's not enough to just poke around the UI and play a game or two. App launching speedruns really don't grade performance or take thermal throttling into account. The iPhone XS performs great in daily use. But I'd be really hard-pressed to find substantial daily differences in the feel of this performance over a phone like the OnePlus 6 at half the price. So I don't really have a proper conclusion to the performance section of this review, outside of continuing to ask, what do we really get for this more powerful chipset? We apparently don't need more screen resolution, but we're excited about a beefier processor limited by phone software? I don't get it. Before we leave performance though, we should talk about radio management. Apple is currently feuding with Qualcomm and they're tapping Intel for their radios. The results are about what you would expect. Intel is a couple generations behind. Looking at LTE reception around town, especially in some challenging areas near me, I saw between 10 and 15 decibel deficits compared to my LG V40. In a tough spot, my garage, which kills cell phone signal, that results in a noticeable reduction to data rates. Wi-Fi faced some similar concerns on my mesh router. From the same locations around my home, based on the phone reporting, I often saw about a 10 decibel deficit compared to the LG V40. I really don't want to slam Apple here. Not on this one. Qualcomm is a dominating force in mobile, so straying from the Qualcomm camp is tough, almost impossible without some compromises. Intel is catching up, and if we don't want to be stuck in a monopolistic market, consumers need competition. You can't have competition if you don't actually buy competing products. The 10s performed well around town, though I could imagine this might be frustrating for folks who live farther out on the edges of their carrier's network just something to consider. My kudos for Apple making a bold move like this is of course tempered by the fact that Apple consumers are still footing the bill for a premium product that does not perform at the same level as less expensive alternatives. And that brings us to iOS. Like I mentioned earlier, we've had to mangle this operating system a bit more to adapt to significant hardware changes. Really buckling down to use the phone as a daily driver for a week I got used to everything, but that doesn't mean I liked any of the more significant changes. Swiping gestures just never arrive at the same elegance or simplicity as a button press, something I'm super anxious about in Android land on Pi also. This sours the overall philosophy of iOS for me. The phone should get out of the way of the apps and services you want to use. This combination of hardware and software requires more attention and interaction more managing the product than any previous iPhones I've reviewed. And for our adaptation to the gadget, we still have the same UI concerns we've always had on iOS. Dumping apps onto a flea market collection of home screens with only basic folders for organization. Really? No alphabetizing? And it's still fastest to reorganize your layout by hooking it up to another computer and using iTunes. That's just silly. Notifications are thankfully cleaner, but even with some stacking, there's still more swiping and scanning to get a sense of what's happening in your digital life. When we look at reporting software like Screen Time, I think quality of interaction is very important. It's critical to the future of smartphones, but I don't believe Apple is really giving us the best tools to improve our interactions. We just get more information to manage, which I believe will ultimately become more noise for the end user. I doubt two years from now, we'll still be looking at screen time as any kind of valuable reporting metric. It is worth mentioning that Apple has been doing a much better job of supporting older phones with updates. But we also have to acknowledge that from iOS 10 to iOS 12, Apple has been in more of a bug-fixing holding pattern than in moving the needle on new features. It's great that performance improved on four-year-old iPhones, but that should also come with some discussion, some acknowledgement that Apple did not deliver the optimization they promised when those phones launched. If the argument for a walled ecosystem is delivering the best optimization, the best hardware and software synergy, we see that the reality of the iPhone doesn't always live up to the claims Apple marketing makes. If Apple were really pushing the boundaries, if these products were really as revolutionary as Apple marketing would have us believe, 
I think we'd be utilizing services which would have left older phones farther behind. OS updates are great. I can't really throw shade there. But this software really isn't driving the hardware. Not if my A9 can still largely keep up. Now I've got a full deep dive on the iPhone camera, a 30 minute video rendered at 2160p at 60 frames per second, available on patreon.com slash some gadget guy. And I've already shared the conclusion from that review publicly on this YouTube channel for free. The long and short of the camera analysis, the 10S is good to very good in nearly every auto mode scenario you might want to use it in. But this is another generation of heavier handed computational post-processing which makes output less consistent, something I've always respected in the past on iPhones. Less learning curve upgrading from phone to phone, but now I trust the results from this processing a little less. It's in software that hopefully we will see improvements. The patch for selfie blurring had not yet arrived while I was shooting this review, but those kinds of software tweaks will be appreciated across the whole camera, not just on the selfie shooter. Though no amount of software can really rein in these lens flares. Tying this back to my thesis at the top of this video, at this price, you're getting very good performance but every point we can look at is likely surpassed on a competing device. Apple no longer represents the best auto mode or HDR mode. I think we can give that win to the Pixel. Apple no longer features the best novelty modes like slow motion video. Out of the box, competitors can also offer up more complete manual modes and raw capture and controls without having to resort to third-party apps. And we need to have a similar conversation about audio. And again, I have a proper audio breakdown on patreon.com slash some gadget guy. It's tough untangling my feelings over the company that gave us the iPod years ago, now treating audio like a bastard stepchild. At $1,000, you don't get a headphone adapter in the box. You do get these crap earbuds, which encourage hearing damaging listening habits, and they won't work with your iMac or MacBook, so the more convenient solution is to spend even more on Bluetooth. It's pain point on top of pain point to get another accessory upsell out of you, the consumer. Audio is one of the basics. That's a core use feature on a smartphone. Apple broke one of the basics and you get to pay more to fix what they broke. The speakers are pretty decent though, so it does have that going for it. But cool technology isn't any fun if you don't have a decent battery to power it all, right? We used to cage iPhone discussion around some idea of efficiency. Because of the tight hardware, software, optimization, iPhones had much better runtime per milliamp hour of battery capacity. Unfortunately, Apple also engaged in a reprehensible practice of throttling CPU performance as batteries would age. We can't dance around that capacity argument anymore. Not only for daily use, but longevity of the battery cell, it's just better to start with a bigger battery. The 10S is much closer to the normal capacity we would expect from a smaller flagship landing near the total we would find on the smaller Pixel 2 or my Xperia XZ1 Compact from 2017. In daily use, it's average. I don't see any advantage anymore in runtime. Video streaming tests, call tests, web browsing, gaming, my general experiences all mirror what I would get from similarly spec'd Androids with just the nominal reporting differences, margins of error we would expect. That's not bad. The smaller iPhone runs like any other smaller premium phone and is often outperformed by phones with slightly larger batteries depending on the test. And we should all enjoy paying top dollar for average performance. The recharge story gets uglier though. With what's in the box, this is one of the worst recharge rates I've reviewed in years. Do you want to charge faster? It'll cost you more to support a feature included in the phone. And I'm not sure Apple users should buy Apple's faster charger. I'll point you to Tech Alter's examination of Oppo and SuperVOOC charging to finish this section of my review. Watch that video. Apple runs your phone hotter to achieve a faster recharge rate that still can't catch OnePlus or Huawei, which will likely wear down your battery faster over time we don't get the best starting capacity to begin with from a company that's played games in the past with battery life and phone performance. 
color me cranky and it still bugs me i have to swipe for the control center to get an actual battery percentage on my screen why just show me that when i could attach a gesture to such a simple piece of information but i digress Whew. so that's enough rambling from me let's wrap this up where's that leave us with the iphone 10s it's not just about feelings it's about analyzing claims and balancing those claims against a price the 10s sucks a lot of the fun out of a new phone review simply for pushing us into a second year of thousand dollar price tags a glass on glass sandwich with a great screen to body ratio great color saturation and contrast very good auto mode camera average screen resolution average battery life below average wireless radio performance terrible recharge speeds and a terrible headphone situation out of the box $1,000. At $1,000, you still need to spend a lot more to bump up storage, offset future repair costs, and there are numerous accessories to purchase to fully use this device. $1,000 is not enough. You gotta pay more to really get the full use out of your initial investment. There's no special use case here. There's no specialty mode or offering. It's a totally normal, premium phone experience which last year, we would have priced somewhere around $700, maybe $750. And this is where my review gets stuck. If you like iOS, if you're invested in Apple's App Store, or you buy media off of iTunes, your options are limited. There's the iPhone XR, though that's still a high price to pay for Apple's version of a mid-ranger phone. Otherwise, you can use an older phone like an iPhone 8 or 8 Plus, or you just have to pay the price to continue being a member of Team iOS. You just have to accept higher and higher costs to keep your iMessages blue. It would be the height of douchebaggery for me to say, just switch to an Android. Like an ecosystem swap is easy. That stuff is tricky, it's messy, and you honestly might not like the available options in Android land. But Apple aggressively pricing higher, encouraging accessory add-ons for basic functionality, and this coming from a company that is engaged in some questionable consumer tactics like throttling your CPU, trying to obfuscate build quality issues, and working to block third-party repair shops weighs heavily against my use of an individual phone. It makes using an expensive, brand new gadget a lot less fun. To my original thesis at the beginning of this video, the iPhone XS is a fine phone, a very good phone in most use cases but it represents a poor value for the asking price. And I don't know what to do about that. As always, thanks so much for watching. There's plenty more to talk about on Apple's strategy this year. I have individual videos on Face ID, benchmarking, reducing hearing loss from using AirPods or EarPods, and my attempts to streamline iOS for less distracting use. Plus those deep dive reviews on the camera and audio tech, if you really want to see what a $1,000 phone can do, head on over to patreon.com slash somegadgetguy, where we can continue that conversation. Patrons also get other fun perks like early access to videos, behind the scenes, and production diaries, and it's shaping up to be a really fun community of like-minded tech pals, so I hope you'll check it out, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at somegadgetguy on the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the Instagrams. And I will catch you all on the next review. This phone has almost never been out of my office naked. I am no Neil deGrasse Tyson phone flipping ninja. And even he uses a skin to change the conditions of his claim.